Good evening, everybody. What a great turnout. I, I cannot tell you how excited I am about this. Um, my name is Tracy Timby. I'm the Dean of the Business Studies Department here at Buck. Makes my day. I cannot, I can't even express my appreciation enough to all of you for coming out. But kind of a rainy night. Um, I know some of you were incentivized, but many of you came on your um, own accord, so thank you again. Um, we are very privileged to have author and entrepreneur Kevin Cruz with us tonight. As you can imagine, events like these don't come together very easily and only happen through the generosity and support of many people. Kevin, a Bucks County resident, appears here without charge. As you know from flyers that have been placed everywhere, um, he is an award-winning author as well as a columnist for Forbes magazine. Our generous sponsor, First Savings Bank, provided the food and beverage for you all. So if you haven't had anything, please help yourself. We have food for 100. Although we have over 100 here tonight. My um, wonderful department faculty and administrative staff, couldn't, I could not have pulled this together without them. Additionally, we have our award-winning business club members here tonight, who are also very helpful in how to direct people in the rain. Vision for our entrepreneurship programs and uh, Events such as these come from Board of Trustee member Otto Brook, as well as our College President Stephanie Shamblett, who are also in attendance tonight. Be sure to post and tweet using hashtag BucksCCC right now. <laughs> Not kidding. No, seriously. Right. Um, feel free to take pictures and put them on Instagram. Follow me. I'm at Business Dean Timby on Instagram and follow me, post, whatever you, you like within reason. Let's keep it respectful. Um, and sign in. If you haven't already gotten a sign in sheet if you're a student, please be sure to do that. Um, and complete the program evaluation because we do always look for feedback for these types of events so that we can bring the events to you that you really find worthwhile. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Kevin Cruz. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, everyone, for showing up tonight. Just grabbing some water here. It's a little warm. I have a, uh, my oldest daughter is a senior at uh, Council Rock South, so as uh, she pulled into the driveway and almost hit me as I was driving out of the driveway, she just yelled, Dad, I have friends there. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> so I'll try not to do that. Um, I have some a handful of slides. I hate power, I hate slides. But to sort of help me to stay on track about why I really do think it is absolutely the best time in the history of the planet to be an entrepreneur or a part-time entrepreneur or a solopreneur. Um, just to give it context, I wanted to share a little bit about my own journey uh, in, in business. And I remember really clearly the very day that I decided to become an entrepreneur. It's once upon a time, around 1977, Southern California, a hot summer day. It's good to be 10 years old, standing on the front lawn. I can remember I'm tossing an orange Nerf football, just hoping for a spider, my friend Roy. When you're 10 years old, you are really living in the moment. It's you, your friend, the grass, and just trying to get that spiral every time. A car quickly drove by the house and it caught our eye. See that? It was a Corvette. And I didn't grow up poor, but I grew up maybe lower middle class, and there were no Corvettes in our neighborhood, so that was something to see at the time. And then all of a sudden, it turned around, and it pulled up to our house, and pulled up to the front curb. What's that all about? The guy's probably lost. He's going to ask for directions. He's not going around here. A big guy gets out. Really big guy. I don't know how he picked that car. Black suit, mirrored sunglasses, and one other sort of odd thing. He only had one arm. 
His shirt sleeve was pinned up on the one side. As a 10-year-old, this guy looked like a villain out of a James Bond movie. <laughs> he took one look at me, and he marched right up on the lawn, looked down, says, is your father home? I said, no. Is your father John Cruz? Yeah, yeah, that's my dad. Is he home? No. Are you sure he's not home? I can see myself in his mirrored glasses. If he ain't home, I don't know he's going to come back. This guy hands me his business card and says, tell him to call me. He's, he's going to call me. And he drives away. Well, that doesn't happen every day. Dad comes home at night after dinner, and he's sitting at the kitchen table with his black cup of coffee just kind of staring at me. And I tell him about the one-armed man. Give him the card, he looks at the card, he just tosses it, and he's looking down at his coffee. What, what's that all about, Dad? You gonna call him? Nope. Well, what's he want? He wants money. You're not gonna call him? Aren't you scared? Nope. I ain't scared. Why aren't you scared? You look like a pretty scary guy. Finally, Dad looks up. He says, because there's nothing left for them to take. What I didn't know my dad was an entrepreneur, and he had tried several different businesses. And he ended up buying one. It was a company that made pool tables of all things. And he leveraged the house to buy the pool table company. That pool table company struggled and struggled. And like a lot of businesses, it was undercapitalized, didn't have enough money to ride out the hard times. And he had thought that. Um, that, that we had a saving grace it was back around Christmas time. Apparently in the pool table industry, almost all the sales were around, around Christmas. And there was a giant order that had come in. And my dad put everything he had in it to, to build the pool tables, put it on a truck, and the, the dealer was outside of Las Vegas. We were in Southern California. And my dad got the call in the middle of the night that that truck, the driver had fallen asleep, crashed, flipped the truck, Fortunately, the driver was okay, but there was splintered pool tables all over the highway to Las Vegas that night. And that was the final straw. So my father went out of business, and we lost you know, everything we had. We moved out of that house maybe two months after the one our man came by. So that night, I can remember writing in my journal, 10 years old, I don't care what it takes, but when I grow up, I'm going to have a lot of money. And today, that kind of sounds funny, like a, a Gordon Gecko Wall Street dream kind of thing. But, you know, it was coming from the place of being a scared 10-year-old kid and just never wanting to go through that experience again. So that was the day I knew that I was going to succeed, oddly, where my father did not. I once told a therapist that story, and she said, Kevin, the only thing I don't understand about that story, I follow you right up to the point where you decide to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> it's like, why did that scare you away? And I'm not sure why uh, that was the case. So I uh, was the first, first kid in my family to go to college. I paid my way through, through Rutgers uh, in New Brunswick. And um, as soon as I got out, uh, as soon as I graduated, I said, I am going to start my, my first company. Now this was a time when there was a lot of excitement, I mean, similar to, to today, in the computer industry and the software industry. I saw in person Bill Gates talking about the vision of the future, the vision that Microsoft was going to build, and I just felt like it was inevitable. And just as you hear it now, certainly back then, I mean, the folklore is a bunch of smart, hard-working young people in a garage inventing the next great thing, and, and you know, everything is successful and makes a lot of money. And I didn't have any money. <clears throat> I couldn't afford both an office and uh, an apartment. So I did the logical thing, and I got the office. <laughs> it was a 10 by 10 foot spare room in a small accounting firm in Skillman, New Jersey. And what they didn't know was I was living there. So I would work until about midnight. I would take my pillow out of the filing cabinet. I didn't have any customers. I didn't have any files. And I would sleep under the desk. And then I would wake up at 5 in the morning before anyone else came into the office to see I lived in there. 
And I would drive to the Princeton YMCA, take a shower, and then drive back in and start working for the day. You hear a lot these days about hustle. You know, bragging about the hustle, down with the hustle, it's all about the hustle. I worked 6 a.m. to midnight for 365 straight days. I mean, I worked it on my birthday, I worked it on Christmas, I worked it on the weekends. And at the end of that year, you know, I wanted to be the next Bill Gates, and I was not. Looking at that YMCA mirror, there was no Bill Gates looking back at me. So that business I shut down, and I had maxed out my credit cards, and I was deeply in debt. I worked for someone for about a year, year and a half, and then I tried again. Uh, this time with a, a, a partner with a slightly better uh, business model. And that company lasted, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe two years. And it was sustainable, but not great. Uh, partnerships are hard in any situation. <clears throat> Being a non-confrontational introvert, it's not good. I didn't know how to fight. I didn't know how to, we both didn't know how to fight productively. We didn't know how to talk. We didn't know how to, how to allocate responsibilities and roles. So we agreed to shut that company down. Strike two. <laughs> I guess I was about 25 years old at that time and uh, got another job for a while, and then uh, paid off the credit cards. I always felt as soon as I got to zero, I could go back into debt and start again, which I'm not advising. Um, third time uh, was the charm. So the third business I had, which was, uh, to put it simply, sort of an online uh, uh, a computer training company for corporations. Uh, it wasn't in the education space, it was more in the corporate training space. And <clears throat> remember, I mean, I was doing this, I didn't really realize this back then, for the wrong reason. You know, I was trying to get to a certain financial level by the time I was 30. Like in my mind, I needed to beat the one-armed man by the time I was 30. Why 30? I don't know. So I, uh, I had built the company to about a million dollars a year in revenue, which is kind of a magic number for a sustainable, you know, small, small company. I've been at it for almost five years, and it took me a long time just to get to that one million. And um, things were okay, but at this point, you know, you're 30 years old, you're married, you've got little kids, uh, you know, your spouse is expecting you to scrape wallpaper on the weekends and paint and all this horrible stuff. You know, it's not as easy as when you're 21, and I was tired. And there were a couple of companies that had sent me uh, letters and then visited to say, hey, you like what you're doing, we might want to acquire your company, want to buy you out. But then I was very eager. I mean, hey, you know, uh, I want to I wanna beat the one-armed man. If the number's right, I'm, I'm going to do it. And those things didn't work out. And I can remember uh, I was uh, probably 8 o'clock at night, long day, get back to my desk, and just as a, uh, like a break, I'm going through the mail, and there was a letter that uh, it, had, it had a typo in my name, and the way they had addressed the letter, I could just tell even from the envelope that they had obviously bought my name from some list. It wasn't a personal letter. But I opened it up because I was kind of bored, and it said, hey, we're interested in maybe acquiring your company. Uh, we're looking at these companies in this space. And again, there were typos in the letter. I could tell this was just a joke, and I crumpled it up and threw it in the trash can. About 10 o'clock that night, when I needed another break, Go back to the desk and I thought, you know what? If they're mass mailing these letters out, it's true, I'm not interested, but it means all my competitors are getting this letter too. I'd probably better find out more about these people who are trying to buy companies in my space. So I dig the letter out of the garbage can and I read it again and it caught my eye. I said, all right, I'm gonna call them. It was after hours and I called and Barry Rain, whose name was, answered the, the, the phone. <clears throat> this is a time when you know, mobile phones were <coughs> big, giant bricks. So that was unusual that he answered the phone. And <clears throat> he very quickly convinced me to take a meeting. And that's sort of a strategy. A lot of people you know, in sales try to sell for the end thing. It's easier to sell each step at a time. He wasn't trying to sell me on selling my business or why they were the right thing. He just said, Take a meeting. I'm going to sell you on the day to take a meeting. Sure, I'll take a meeting. That meeting impressed me enough where they set up for me to drive to meet their CEO in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. 
Rudy Carson. And at that point, I thought I was just kicking tires. I wasn't sure if they were serious or not. You know, I kind of had a number in my mind. Okay, this is the number I need to sell. And Rudy's an interesting character. He, um, a couple years ago, he ended up selling his business to IBM for $1.3 billion. And at the time, his business was a $35 million company. And so we go in, and when you're talking about doing a business deal, the, the, the cold truth is the person who's looking to sell really just wants to know what the number is going to be. The person who's looking to buy wants to know what the number is going to get you. It's really about the number. But you can't, that's so crude, you, can't, you just can't come out and say that. So you talk about, oh, what's your vision? Oh, what's your vision? How's your culture? Oh, what's your culture? Like? So you go through this dance. So I knew that, and I said, so Rudy, um, you know, tell me, what, uh, what plans do you have for, uh, for your company, Conexa? You know, what, where do you see this company in the future? And you expect to hear the normal, oh, we're going to grow and invest, it's all about the customer, and blah, blah, blah. He said, I want to be the first company that opens an office on Mars. <laughs> what? I laughed. He says, no, I'm serious. He says, I, I, it's uh, my goal in life to get to Mars before I die. So I want to open a branch office on Mars. Well, that caught my attention. We went for a walk, and an hour later, he finally says, Kevin, he says, listen, what are we doing here? He said, do you want to sell or don't? And I said, Rudy, what's the number? I've got a lot, of, a lot of time, money, and effort into this. What's the number? He ended up giving me a number that was double what I'm going to take. Another lesson about negotiation. It's the old adage that um, whoever gives the first number loses. Whoever goes first loses. There's a lot of truth in that. Um, but he knew what a fair value was, what a fair deal was. He'd rather give me fair value and earn my trust and keep me as a partner for years and a friend. We're still friends today. Um, than to take advantage of me, even though I would have gone for half that. And then maybe somehow made an enemy. So that company, uh, I then, that was my first business that I sold uh, when I was 30. And I spent about five years working with Rudy. And it was the late 1990s in what was a dot-com bubble. Some people think we're in another one right now. Valuations were going sky high. We raised $35 million of venture capital. The plan was for us to go public, to go IPO. We spent a lot of time and money preparing for that. We were about six weeks away and the stock market crashed and the tech sector crashed and we got a call from the investment bankers who said nobody's going public this year you guys need to stop growing and worry about surviving this was the hardest business day of my life <clears throat> our strategy what i was told from rudy what everyone agreed to was raise the money spend it higher 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 grow 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 sell 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 don't worry about profits because we're going to get more money when we go public. It's a game. See who can get big fast. It changed literally in a day. And Rudy called me and said, Kevin, you've got 24 hours to pick which third of your department, your team, you're going to fire. So day after tomorrow, you've got to fire a third of your people. Now, many of the people on my team I had only brought on and hired a couple of weeks before. You know, I convinced them to leave solid, secure, good paying jobs. You know, I sold them on the dream, and here it was two, three weeks later, I'm laying them off. Worst freaking day of my life. It was awful. That, uh, I ended up leaving that company, starting another business called, um, uh, Ax well, sold, sold another division, Started another company called Action Professional Health Learning here in Yardley, uh, not far from here, right across from Shady Brook Farm. And in, um, <laughs> because I knew what I was doing this time, in about four years, grew that to be a $12 million a year business. And then sold that to a company that's called Huntsworth Health out of, um, out of England. And they're still there, they're doing, they're doing fine. I, I, I have three kids at home and decided after that business that I would slow down a little bit. So I've been doing uh, some nonprofit work, working with some associations, and a passion of mine is writing. So I wrote, I started writing in earnest, and I've, I've primarily been writing about leadership. I've got a new book that's coming out in a couple of weeks. I've got a couple of co copies I'm going to give away that's all about time and productivity, which is a bit of a, a shift for me. 
Uh, it was a fun project. I ended up interviewing seven billionaires, including Mark Cuban, um, over 200 entrepreneurs, including the co-founders of Airbnb and Facebook and uh, Groupon, all these companies. Just asking, what's your number one piece of advice for time management? What's your number one secret to productivity? Interviewed 13 Olympic athletes, gold medalists, and I interviewed 29 high school and college students who um, were straight A students. What is your secret to overcoming procrastination? What's your secret for overcoming social media distractions? And I created this book, you know, 15 Secrets uh, Successful People Know About Time Management. So I've been shifting from the entrepreneurial stuff. I still invest in a few things. I was a, a partner in what was Team Capital Bank not far from here that we sold a couple years ago. So I'm still active in small ventures, but I'm now spending more time uh, writing and speaking when, when, I'm, uh, when I'm asked to. Um, I wanted to give you that context because I don't have a lot of slides, but I want to let you know that this is where I'm coming from. I want to quickly share my thoughts and then really spend the rest of the time on questions. I'd rather hear what's on your mind, get any questions you have, if anyone's interested in you know, maybe you already have a startup or a side um, business, I'd love, I'd love to hear about it. So, <clears throat> on that note, when most people talk about or celebrate entrepreneurship today, they're talking about these crazy, extreme uh, deals that are going out there. You know, Facebook buys Instagram for a billion dollars. Now, that's old news, that's a couple years ago, but the reason why that was so shocking was one, Instagram had no revenue, they had no sales. <laughs> They were given a billion dollars even though they weren't earning any money themselves. They had a handful of employees, were a couple years old, and Zuck gave them a billion dollars. Facebook to buy WhatsApp for $19 billion in a deal shop. Similar story, they had some revenue, and I think 20 employees. A company that's a couple, just a handful of years old, getting $19 billion. Uber. Who rides Uber? Amazing, right? Awesome company. Uber is valued at more than $50 billion. They don't own their vehicles. They don't own real estate. They don't own anything. It is an app. It is an app. It's digital. Bits and bytes worth $50 billion. I mean, it's crazy. And look at this, so Starwood Hotel, giant chain, global chain, is right now has a net worth of $14 billion. Marriott, we all know Marriott, $21 billion. You guys know who's coming next? Airbnb, $26 billion. Airbnb, they don't own any buildings. They don't own any real estate. They have one one thousandth of the number of employees that the others have. They're an app worth $26 billion. Silicon Valley calls these unicorns. <clears throat> I am not talking about these companies when I say it's the best time ever to be an entrepreneur because these are unusual, these are rare, we could be in a bubble, who knows. I'm talking about it's great for everyone to be an entrepreneur. That for every one of those, there's a million other people that are making great money, great lifestyle, whether as a solo entrepreneur or with a, with a small business. Um, I think the mythology around these unicorns is sort of uh, uh, giving people the wrong idea about why you might want to do it. The reason why I say it's the best time, uh, four reasons. Access to capital, which is just money, cost of technology is low, the size of the market is doubling, and the cost of labor is low. So when I talk about access to capital, uh, just to put this into perspective, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, for most of, of you know, civilized history, to start a business, I mean, you needed a lot of money. If it, if it was agrarian, you needed land, you needed to buy land. If it was uh, industrial age, you needed a lot of money to build a factory. Even recently, so 20 years ago when I started my company, there was a vague notion that maybe there's a small business loan out there, but it's confusing and hard, and probably they're not going to give money to a 21-year-old kid who's never done this before. And there's bank loans. Banks don't lend money to you unless you don't need the money. Sorry, the bankers in the room. But that's basically true. So most banks lend if you have collateral. Well, what are you going to put up? 
So we know we're getting our money back. You willing to put up your house? Oh, you don't own a house? How about your the building that you work in? Oh, you don't own that building? Well, the car you're driving probably ain't going to cover it, right? You can't get a loan unless you already have money or, or a sustainable business to, that they feel confident to pay it off in. What's the world like today? <clears throat> Venture capital investment gets an almost 15-year high. Venture capitalists, if you're in the right space and know the right people, I mean, this is crazy. They will fund. Valuations are at crazy levels. Here. You can have an idea on an app and get valued at $5 million, $10 million. You can have a term for it. Um, PPV, your pre-product valuation. How we will value you before you even have a product. <laughs> so they're funding companies even though they don't have a product. Uh, there's more angel investors than ever before. So what's happened is Silicon Valley uh, out in California, Silicon Alley in New York, even the Philadelphia area has some, some angel networks. All these entrepreneurs, the Facebook millionaires, the Apple millionaires, all these people that have had some success, well, what do you do? Oh, well, I think I'm a genius at business. I like tech. Let me invest in other startups. There are more angel investors than ever before. Just search angel investor on LinkedIn, you'll hit a thousand people that you can send an email to and say, hey, here's an idea, do you want to fund it? And I get about five of those emails a day. Who needs stinking angel money? Who needs stinking venture capital when you can just crowdfund, right? So Kickstarter, this is one of the most successful crowdfunding campaigns ever. So this guy uh, invented the coolest cooler. It ain't no regular cooler, it's got a stereo, you can charge your phone, it's got all this cool stuff in it. He raised $13 million. If you're not familiar with these websites, you go on, you browse all these crazy good ideas, games, books, film projects, businesses, tech, tech projects. You read about the project and you say, okay, yeah, I'll give you uh, $100 for one of those coolers. Or I'll give you 200 and you're going to give me a special special color cooler because it's better. It's a cooler cooler. Nice. Um, but think about this. Bank loans? $13 million. Did anyone ask to see his resume? Did anyone ask what his collateral was? Does he own his own home? How is he going to pay it back? Has he ever run a business before? Can we see the product? What's your sales? The product doesn't exist yet. He's got a prototype. And there's tons of these deals out there. Who wants to invent um, a better way to harvest honey from bees? Well, this father-son team did. They said, hey, help us fund a company to make these honey bee things. Twelve and a half million dollars raised on uh, Indiegogo. And who needs money anyway to start a business? Like, maybe we can just sidestep. Because the cost of everything has just gone down. So who needs factories anymore? If you don't know Alibaba, Alibaba is the online clearinghouse for every manufacturer in China. You want sports equipment, you want mobile phones, you want TVs, you want anything. You can go browse it and go order five, ten, a hundred, a thousand. I know a guy who um, saw a cell phone case, smartphone case in the mall that he wanted for 20 bucks. He was curious, so he went on Alibaba and searched for it and found it that he could buy them for a dollar a piece. He ordered a hundred and sold them to all of his friends for ten bucks a piece because it was half the price that they were paying in the mall. I mean, you you don't you can outsource your manufacturing so easily. I've got a lot of friends that uh, you know they want to invent their own product, so they'll find something similar on Alibaba, reach out to those manufacturers and say, hey, I want to do a custom project. They go back and forth, they ship the prototype, sometimes they get on a plane and fly over, and all of a sudden you've got a, a, a physical good that you can, you can sell. Who needs servers or databases? My first uh, company, we had an online testing program, which was revolutionary for its day. And the pharmaceutical employees would, at night, to test their knowledge of things, they would dial up on their modems into my server. I had five modems in my server, and uh, so we could handle five people at a time. They'd take a test, and I would have their scores. This was revolutionary. 
Now, I, it's cheap by today's standards, but it was a lot of money back then. So I probably paid, I think it was five to $10,000 for the hardware, another five or $10,000 for the software. And I put it in the closet of my office. It just was plugged in and ran in the closet. There were no data centers or things, it was just sitting there. There was a problem with that because uh, the client kept telling us that at late at night, around 10, 30 or 11, there were a lot of reports about people being halfway through their test and then getting thrown off and didn't save their test. They were getting upset. We, just figured, we couldn't figure out what was going on. Maybe too many people were logging in at the same time or something. I stayed late once and uh, was thinking about the problem. And I was monitoring it from a different computer. And all of a sudden, it kicked off. What the heck's going on? And I look out my office, and the cleaning lady had unplugged the server to plug her back from the <laughs> She wasn't used to people running computers, you know, overnight. There's nobody there. Why would anybody need this thing plugged in? Every night she would unplug my server. It would go down. She would vacuum my floor. She'd plug it back in, and it would pop back up again. Later, when we raised that thirty-five million dollars of venture capital at Connexa, this was now big time, uh, kind of an early SaaS company. And about $5 million went flying out the door for servers and database software. And it was a big internal debate. Do you spend all this money on Oracle database or on the Microsoft SQL? There's all these wars. And it was $5 million bucks. Now, you go into Amazon Web Services, AWS. Any tech people in here who want to know AWS? I mean, it, it's amazing. It's like on-demand scale up. You, you're not using it, don't, don't pay for it. You use it a lot, you pay more for it. You know, you don't have a server in your closet. You don't have to pay a data center like I was doing with all these racks of servers. They're handling everything. They're handling the backups. They're handling the virus protection, the security, for cheap. <clears throat> Who needs IT? Who needs stinking IT? Google Apps, got yourself uh, email addresses, spreadsheets, documents for free. Oh, you got more than five people? Fine, pay us 20 bucks a month or something ridiculous. WordPress. You know, about a fifth of the entire internet's running on WordPress. Free, easy to use program. All my sites now are WordPress sites. It costs almost nothing. Who needs a stinking office anymore? <laughs> 20 years ago, I would hire, I worked with freelancers all the time as a way to manage costs. And it was taboo. You couldn't tell your client that someone on your team was a freelancer. So we would, we would make business cards with their name on it, even though they weren't full-time employees. If the client was coming in, we would tell them to come into the office and just sit there, pretend that was their office or that was their desk. You don't need to do that anymore. I mean, it's just normal to have a distributed workforce, virtual, virtual workforce. There are a lot of companies that have no office whatsoever. Automatic, the company that builds WordPress, maintains WordPress, and they have hundreds of employees scattered all over the world, and they don't have a single office. The size of the market it is a good time to be us. It's a good time to be in your 20s. Um, in the next you know, 15 years, the middle class around the world will grow from 2 billion to 5 billion. So you just think about anything that you buy, you know, whether it's a, a coat or a smartphone or a book online or a training program, whatever it is, well, there's going to be 3 billion more people around the world that want that stuff too. So the market, even though our economy's been soft and you hear day-to-day -day, uh, worries about the economy, the long-term trend is moving in the right direction. It's going to be hard to fail as long as you're global. Not a lot of growth's happening in the States. My buddies that um, are running like, conference companies, all the growth is happening in Latin America. Not so much Europe. It's China and it's <laughs> Latin America. Cost of labor and expertise. You want to learn something, obviously go to YouTube. You want to find someone, find someone with special expertise, reach out to an angel investor, just go on LinkedIn. Um, Fiverr, Odesk, for those of you who don't know, you know this is a, a marketplace for freelancers. Fiverr is like, you can get anything for five bucks. And of course, it's kind of like, if you want something big, then it's, it's like 10 Fivers. <laughs> they just stack them on you. It's uh, just as an example. So this book, and we can get into, you know, in the, in the questions about disruption of, like, different industries, including the publishing industry. So this is a book that I've set up my own publishing company on. I've done uh, two books with traditional publishers, and I've done several with my own, own imprint. The cover designer 
I found on Fiverr, did discover, he lives in Sri Lanka. I've never spoken to him or seen him or met him in my life. I had to Google Sri Lanka to find out where in the world he lived. I'm embarrassed to say that, but that's true. Um, I had two book editors. They both were previously New York, uh, New York publishing house editors, professional editors. They're now freelancers. $200, they edited the book. Edited the book. Uh, graphic design on the inside is a, a freelancer out of, out of Philadelphia. Um, I have built a website for the book using software that costs you know, a few dollars per month. Every single thing has been outsourced. You know, I've got, um, because of this book launch uh, that I'm doing, I needed, uh, I needed a full-time support person, but I don't want to hire a full-time employee for all the headaches that go with full-time employees. I posted on Facebook that I'm looking for someone to fill this thing. I had 10 people reach out to me that afternoon, and I now have Barbara, who lives in Connecticut, who I've now talked to once on Skype, and she's now handling, she probably handled 10 support emails today uh, from people asking questions about the book and the project. So everything can be outsourced um, relatively affordably. Now look, if you want to build a car, we can actually outsource a lot of that too, but there's times when you're going to want to be like an Elon Musk and set up a factory. You know, you want to you go to Mars and in SpaceX, you're going to want to own stuff. You're going to want to have employees. There, I'm not against doing that. But I just wanted to emphasize that for every one of those unicorns that you hear about, these billion dollar exits in Silicon Valley superstars, there are thousands of people um, making uh, inc an incredible living and an incredible life with what they're selling on Etsy by self-publishing their books on Amazon. By, if, if you can teach anybody anything for an hour, think about what you know, whether it's Basket weaving, bird calling, uh, speed reading, how to program Ruby on Rails, whatever you think you could teach somebody, an hour worth of content, you can sell that as a course. You can go to uh, kajabinext.com and very easily start a course. You can go to Udemy, I'm sure many of you know, know that. So there's lots of ways to be a side entrepreneur, a solopreneur, or someday, if you want to take the plunge, go ahead and do it and build it. There's never been a better time. You don't need a lot of money. If you need money, it's easier than ever before to raise it. It's easier than ever before to find talent to cover you in the areas that you're not familiar in. Maybe you're strong in marketing, so you need to find someone who's a tech person. Maybe you're the tech person and need someone who's strong in marketing. It's the best time uh, uh, to do it ever. So let me pause on um, that note and uh, take some questions. I know um, uh, Dean Timmy's talking about Twitter. I am at Cruz, K-R-U-S-E. Um, I'm guessing most of you, though, it's like Twitter. You're going to probably like Snapchat or something, right? Which, um, we're not on. Um, Instagram and, and email is there. I'd love to hear any questions from you, and I'll bribe someone with the first question with a, a free copy of my new book. It doesn't come out for a couple of weeks. Oh, I got one right there. I'm going to bribe the work. Um, just as you were writing your book, you were doing... Thank you. Dean Timothy. As you were writing your book, Kevin, and you mentioned that you were interviewing billionaires and Olympic medalists and people from... Uh, the major money makers in America. How do you find them? Do you just call Zucker up and say, hey, do you, what, what are you up to? What's that up, man? I, I did do that, but he didn't return the calls or the emails. Um, <laughs> so the question is, you know, so how do I get these people to, to respond? And so there's two parts to it. Um, sort of uh, philosophically, how do you approach it in the second so philosophically, it's a sales game. So like anything in sales, it's, it's a numbers game. So I got seven billionaires to tell me their number one secret to productivity, but I reached out to about 28 or 30. You know, I got 200 entrepreneurs to give me their number one secret to time management productivity. I reached out to 800. You know, I got the co-founders of Airbnb and Groupon and Zynga and Facebook, um, Dustin Moskowitz, it wasn't, it wasn't um, to respond. 
but uh, a lot of others blew me off. You know, I didn't get uh, you know any of the, the from Apple. I didn't get Zuck. I mean, the list goes on. So part of it's a number. It's like a sales game. You just you try, you try, you try, and some will get back to you and say yes. Now the tactical part is if you want to, um, and this is good. You know, this is a good question for not just hey, you want to write a book and interview uh, hard to reach people. It's how do you reach hard to reach people in general? You know, whether you're trying to get a job from them, raise money from them, get them to donate to your charity, you know, whatever it is. Um, brevity is the key. So. We're, it's a book about time management. We all are so stretched for time, right? Everybody's quote unquote crazy busy. So specifically, I would reach out via email, knowing that they're more likely to scan the email at least. And the subject line was one, a one question interview. A one question interview. So in email, when you send people an email, what's your first goal? Get them to open the email. So it's all about the subject line. The subject line's goal is to get them to open the email. Once the email's open, the goal is to get them to respond. So a one, it was just a one-question interview. So that told them, oh, this is an interview. Is it a major media outlet? Is it a small media outlet? Is it from a student? Is it like, you kind of wonder. An interview, even highly successful people are used to talking to the press. They want press. They're thinking about getting their message out. One-question interview. One question tells them it's facts, and also curiosity factor. That's weird, a one question interview. They open it, job one is done. Then again, it's brief, because they're not gonna read a long rambling email. Um, so it's, uh, you know, hi, Mr. Moskowitz. <laughs> um, I'm working on a time management book, and I'm interviewing uh, highly successful entrepreneurs, gathering up their number one piece of advice on time management. My only question is, what is you know, one piece of advice you have on time management productivity? I'd be happy to talk to you on the phone, or a simple reply to this email with a short answer would be great. Thanks for the minutes. And that's, that's it. It's short and it's actionable. They're already in the email. It's really easy for them to hit. Some, some people I talked to, a lot of them were, uh, were emails, but that's really it. You need to um, stimulate their curiosity and keep it short. Who else has a question? Yeah, in the back we're going to go. Then I think up front. Wait, where am I going? My bad, my radar is off. Oh, I saw, I saw uh, right there. So, uh, what would be your best piece of advice for someone that's trying to start a tech, a tech startup? What kind of tech startup? It's a, um, it's a, it's like a fantasy sports predictive model. Um, like man, I wish I had had the idea of um, weekend only fantasy sports betting, huh? Multi-billion dollar companies out of the blue. So, <clears throat> this is going to be a, a bit general. Okay, so the first thing is, with if, if you want to start a startup, there's been a big shift in thinking in the entrepreneur space over the last you know, few decades. Um, while it's true that sometimes entrepreneurs are just brilliant and they've got a crystal ball and they build something and everybody wants it, more often than not, we're wrong. Um, and to prove that point, I mean, the, probably the smartest people um, on the planet, um, other than the Bucks County College professors and administrators, of course, would be venture capitalists. I mean, these people are smart and they put a lot of money into looking for the best ideas to invest in. Out of every 10 deals a venture capital invests in, seven will go out of business, two will break even, and one will make so much freaking money it covers those other nine. So the smartest people in the world fail seven to nine times uh, out of 10 when they're looking at, this makes a great startup. So, a philosophy has emerged around just um, launch fast and iterate fast. So they talk about uh, like a lean startup model, you can Google if you're not familiar with the L-E-A-N, and they talk about creating your MVP, your, mo your, your minimum viable product. So the idea is you've got to move fast to get into the market 
not just to beat competition, but to get feedback from the market. You think red is great, your market's gonna tell you it's blue. You think everybody's gonna love this feature, they're not gonna care about that feature, and they're gonna flood your support box with, how come you don't have this yet, right? Um, so, who, anybody on Periscope in here? I should have asked somebody to scope this thing. Um, so, you look at Periscope and Meerkat, I mean, these things were launched quickly, and the first week they were horrible and buggy and, and glitchy. But then the next week they were better and better and they're adding more and more and more features. And so regardless, the general you know, advice is going to be get your minimum viable product out there and listen to the market. I love that space. I mean, I'm not, I don't participate in it myself, but that is white hot. And so if you've got a, a solid idea, um, you know, you could either you know, do it yourself, take it to a certain level, or just shop it, shop it for funding. But again, this day and age, you know, when you raise raise money, you are selling a piece of your company to someone for those dollars. And while you like those dollars now, you're not going to want to all of a sudden not have that 10, 20, 50 percent of your company down the road. And the venture capitalists are suddenly your boss as well. So. Um, and feel free to follow up afterwards if there's more specific things, but I just think you, you build it and launch it. With apps, it, it's, you, know, you need growth hackers. You need to find, if you're not one, then you need to partner with one. You can have a great app, but there's so many that are flooding out there. You need people that know how to spread the word and get the word out there. It's a hot space. Uh, I think we have, we're up front here next, and then sorry to make you run around with me. I just, Yeah, exactly. Thank you. It seems like the, the valuations of profitable companies, the ones that have recurring revenue models, are so much larger than the one and done ones. Yeah. So if you're in a more traditional space and you're in a one and done, is it worth pursuing in this day and age? Are you starting to chase financing, try to come? Or do you want to find something that has recurring revenue? Yeah. So. Uh, I'm impressed with uh, with that question. So the problem with a lot of businesses are that um, you know if your business is just to sell a widget, you know, a product, when you sell it, that customer goes away, and you need to find a brand new customer to sell another widget to. Um, in the old days, you know, you would buy software, so I'd pay two hundred dollars or something for Microsoft Word, and I wouldn't give Microsoft any more money. Uh, until you know, I upgraded, and I would delay that for as long as possible because I always hated the new versions. But eventually, they just stop supporting the ones, and then they get money like four or five years later. With software as a service, a SaaS model, all of a sudden there's this recurring revenue model, and that's the ideal business to have of any model. It's hey, you know, Kevin, you're not necessarily going to pay me two hundred dollars today. I'll take a lower amount, but you're going to pay me every single month over and over and over again. And it gets into things about um, low barriers to entry. You get people into your, your service or your product, and then you erect high barriers to exit. Why did Ashley Madison get hacked? <laughs> Not looking for personal stories, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> the hackers claim they did it because, and they brought publicity to the fact that once you sign up for Ashley Madison, and you want to delete your account, uh-uh, you can't just delete your account. You're not going to erase your data. You've got to cough up $200 or more to erase your data. And then it turns out they weren't erasing it. They were just taking your $200. That's called a barrier to exit. Oh my gosh, to quit Ashley Madison, i got to pay $200? Luckily, I can afford it, but that's not the point. <laughs> so a software as service, a recurring revenue model, is everybody's dream. I mean, that's what it is. And that was the, the company I raised events and capital for. It was a SaaS business. That is hot. Having said that, the real answer, and this sounds soft, is you need to build the business that you're passionate about, not that's going to make the most money. Because you can still make plenty of money and have a successful business selling all kinds of stuff. You know, whether it's selling time, which is, you know, if you're a consultant, you're selling your time. Uh, uh, that's tough because you want to make more money, you've got to work harder. That's not a great, that's not a scalable business. 
You can still have a great lifestyle and a great company doing that. And if you enjoy it, that's the thing to do. You can still have a great business selling candles or copies of your book, but it's not a recurring revenue model. And for any entrepreneurial venture, I mean, it ne it's, it's always hard. It's always ups and downs. It's just life. I mean, there's good days and bad days, good quarters and bad quarters. Michael Dell is you know, one of the smartest entrepreneurs on the planet. Dell is a huge success story, and yet they missed the boat on tablets and all of that, and you know, that company's in trouble, and he took it private, I and mean, he's got all kinds of problems he's dealing with. You're gonna have problems, you're gonna work hard, so I think pursue your passion. What's the great idea that you would kinda wanna be involved in? I'm guessing someone's kinda into fantasy sports in this room, right? <laughs> the trick is to see if you can find your passion and then create a recurring revenue model. And you know, there's uh, like gift boxes and things are, are very popular now. You know, hey, I'm really into tea, I guess. I'm just making this up. I could probably find the Tea of the Month Club that sends me new tea and a little book and blah, 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 and I just keep paying them like a subscription every single month. So do what you love, what you're interested in, and then try to match, try to get the best model onto it. Make sense? Great. Up here, up front. See, I just let you pick them since you could just pick closer ones. Okay. <laughs> hey, what are you saying? I've only got two I'm left. I've only got two left. I think we're up right here. <laughs> Say I have an idea for an app, and the next step would be to look for investors in the app. Before doing that, should I take any protective uh, measures for my like trademark it or copyright it so nobody steals it out from under me? Yeah, so this is another very smart question about intellectual property protection. I am not a lawyer. I am. There, I was going to say, I know there are some in this room. <laughs> so I hesitate to answer and I uh, <laughs> invite counsel to, <laughs> to correct me. All right, here's the, here's the deal. Uh, don't worry about intellectual property protection too much. Uh, all the time, entrepreneurs are saying, listen, you know, I got a great idea, like they say it to me, Kevin, I got a great idea, I want to put you on it, will you sign my non-disclosure statement? First of all, that is a sure sign you've never done it before in your rookie. Venture capitalists don't sign non-disclosures or non-competes. Angel investors don't sign non-disclosures and non-competes. And the reason why, from our side, is we sign your letter, and we don't actually divulge anything from you, but like we've seen another deal or we had prior knowledge and so something gets out we think we did, it just sets us up for lawsuits because we've signed something. So we say, we ain't signing anything. We're not saying, we're not gonna say anything. Now, when you're, when you're in that kind of position, I mean, everybody is tight-lipped on this stuff. Um, and sharing, like it's very, very rare for the investors to steal the ideas or, or to get inspiration from the ideas. The reality is, and I know everybody's idea is really precious to them, it's not the idea, it's the execution. I mean, right now, the venture capitalists and the angel investors, I mean, it's almost like a joke. It's like Uber's big, right? You know, press the button and the car shows up. So now, it's like the Uber of everything. You know, you pick what it is. Um, I'm going to have the Uber of books. You press a button and the book shows up at your door. I'm going to be the Uber of Chinese food. You press a button and the Chinese food shows up at your door. Like everybody's pitching the same ideas. Uh, it's really more in the execution. Now, having said that, I mean, I think that it's um, wise to seek counsel. And when you have an act, that stuff that can be uh, code that can be copyrighted, and if you're if you're looking to um, if you think the app name is important and all that, you should you know, look, do, do a trademark search. Attorneys will walk you through that, but don't get hung up on, on that. I mean, there's, the ideas are out there as great and as unique as your ideas. I bet there's other people working on it. Amazon was not the first one to do online books. Uber was not the first one to do Uber. It's in the execution. Um, and I would even go further and say, but you, know, you don't need a lot of money to, to do apps. If you, you can find partners who can, you know, ruby on rails that can get you going pretty fast or, or do it yourself, or go to one of these um, code camps, you know, in Philadelphia or elsewhere, where you all go into a room, you buddy up, and you build a product in like two days of launch, you can go far without money. And what impresses the venture capitalists or the angel investors is when you say, hey, listen, 
we've got a, a, an MVP, a minimum viable product here. It's not on the app, so we're not releasing, but we can show you the vision on this and raise money from there. Once you get some interest, once you get around, then go hire counsel and protect it. But I wouldn't worry about talking to the money people about it. All right? Uh, time for one more, I think. You want to pick? What business do you currently own? Do you own, like, a, do you own multiple? What business do I um, currently own? I, you know, I would consider myself more um, of an investor than, a, than an owner operator right now. Uh, I'm like, there's, I've got uh, some money. We own uh, a couple of commercial office buildings in uh, Westchester. Um, we got. We, I'm not a banker, but you know a bunch of us had owned a T Capital Bank up until I guess it's almost two years now. Um, I was actively investing as an angel in a lot of the Philadelphia area uh, uh, tech companies. I'm not such a fan of angel investing for myself these these days. Um, and so the the quote unquote business that I would have is more typical of like what you'd see from a consultant. So. You know, I write a lot of things, and there's book royalty income. There's speaking income, so I'll do, like, usually, you know, I'm on an airplane once a week doing a keynote speech somewhere. Um, and then the third revenue stream related to the books is, is online courses. So if someone, you know, reads the book and likes the book, they can pay $1,000 and take a six-week, you know, online program with me about productivity. But that's more of a, um, it's a, it's a leverage content model, uh, but it's more of a consultant model. It's not really a traditional um, How are we doing on time? What do you think? It's, uh, we have about five minutes. I'm happy to stay, but... Anybody else? Let me... Um, <laughs> but before we do this question, let me, let me uh, tell everybody. So, who wants to get a copy of that book? <laughs> All right. Every single one of you can get a copy of this book for free. Here's how. This book comes out on October 12th. Uh, if you want to join what's called my, my book launch team, um, go to kevincruz.com forward slash blog, or just send me an email, I'll send it to you. And it will give you the details. Basically, you're going to fill out a little form. And immediately, or within 24 hours, you get an email that gives you the electronic copy of the book, either PDF or Kindle, whatever you want, like within 24 hours. The week of October 12th, I email you and I say, hey, hope you like the book. Regardless, I'm hoping you'll take a couple minutes to leave an honest review on Amazon. If you, say, if you don't like the book, just say you hate it. And let me know that you left an Amazon review, and I'll send you a, a copy of the physical book. I'll pay for the shipping and, the book and everything. So if you just want to sign that at that form, you'll immediately get the digital version of the book. If you want to leave a review on Amazon in a couple weeks, I'll send you the, the paper copy. All right? And speaking of reviews, make sure you fill out your evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Again, 